One of my first ever memories is definitely a strange one. I'm standing in my parents' bedroom, standing in front of their mirror, and standing there in silence, just staring at myself. I remember being incredibly confused at what I was staring at in the mirror that day, and I literally remember thinking, who in the world was I? What was I? And like, why am I here? Now, as a biologist, and not your most deeply philosophical person, I can definitely give answers to my past self. You're Holly, Holly. You're a human, a homo sapien to be precise. And you were made by mum and dad. Now, I don't think this memory will be entirely relatable to any of you sitting and listening today, but it's a memory of mine that speaks more than a thousand words about the start of the relationship I built with myself from a young age. Despite being incredibly clueless in front of the mirror that day, I quickly grew into myself, grew to appreciate who I was, and grew to love myself without me even realizing. And that, to me, is the true beauty of your childhood years. And let me tell you a bit about my upbringing. I am very grateful to say that I lived a very happy life growing up at home with my family, with mum, dad, Emily, Matthew, our first two cats, I was happier than I ever could have imagined. After, yes, screaming and running out of classrooms, I quickly became a teacher's pet in school, learned to point my toes in ballet shoes, and would wake up every single morning excited to eat my bowl of cereal. Something else that I think is really quite important to mention here is that I never took myself too seriously growing up. In fact, I was always known as the comedian of our family. Whilst I wouldn't say I was your typical comedian cracking jokes left, right and centre, but I'd do things without me even realising and just make people laugh. Whether that be through filming very strange videos of myself or just dancing in public spaces, people would laugh and they'd laugh at me. It needs to be emphasised. Now... I think you'll be glad to hear that whilst I could stand here all day and talk about the very peculiar things I've done in the past, I think you'll be glad to hear I'm not going to do that. Instead, I hope what I'm going to share with you all today forces you to just take a moment to think about present you. How do you value yourself? Do you care for yourself enough? And do you know yourself better than anyone else sitting in this room today, most importantly? Surprisingly, the relationship we cherish with ourselves is not one we often think about. Instead, we think of relationships with our parents, our siblings, friends, significant others, our pets even, which is definitely the case for me who sits most days at a desk with a cat covering the keyboard. I therefore think it's really quite sad that we cast aside the one relationship that we'll have for the entirety of our lives. I don't think we quite know just how important this relationship is and how much work it needs to keep the flame alive. For a very long time, and for me personally, the time when I had the best relationship with myself was way back when I was 14 years old. For a long time, I lost myself. I completely lost her. And I'd lost the Holly I'd grown to know so well by my early teenage years. You know, by that point, I knew that school was really fun for me. Being in the garden was like transporting myself to a whole other universe. And I loved to dance, to perform more like. Yes, on a big stage, but also just at home in our living room with my sister Em, who I'd make act out every single other character so I could be that Dorothy in red glittery shoes. And if that's not main character energy for you, then I don't know what is. I don't quite know how, when, and where things started to go wrong for me, but I never in a million years saw it coming. And the sad reality of it is that I don't really know where I was heading. Like, what was my goal in me trying to be the smallest version of myself? Was I ever going to be that version of perfect that I chased for so many years? And did I really want to ruin the relationship with not only myself, but all those around me too. Another memory that comes to mind is me sitting and watching the TV programme Super Size versus Super Skinny. 
Now, you may have heard of it, you may have not, and that's totally fine. But this program baffled me. It completely baffled me. As I'd sit there eating my plate of seconds, I'd find it so confusing and frustrating when someone couldn't even eat a single square of chocolate. I, myself, loved food. I was a total foodie, just like you, Mum, who I know is sitting and listening right now. And as I said, I never in a million years saw it coming and thought I would go through something similar. A lot of my struggles with mental health, yes, they've stemmed from food and body image. Yes, a lot of my struggles, they have stemmed from food and body image. Quite ironically, my understanding of the term calorie stemmed from a dance changing run one sunny afternoon. And thank you, Instagram. Yes, thank you for convincing me that thigh gaps were a necessity. To be frank, yes, I had an eating disorder. What started as anorexia then became orthorexia. Underrating has led me to binge eating, and whilst I definitely don't have 2020 vision now, I don't think I ever saw myself in a mirror for who I truly am and what I really look like. I hated my legs, the weakness in my lower abs. One day I was too short, another day too tall, because wow, Holly, you can't just be five foot four. I mean, who's just average? Looking deeper, I truly believe that a lot of my struggles have stemmed from my inner aspiration to be perfect. Growing up, I didn't want to be that singer or that dancer or that vet even saving animals' lives every single day. I wanted to be nothing more than perfect. And let me tell you straight away, perfection doesn't exist. Nobody's perfect or ever will be, and so chasing this dream is quite literally the most bizarre idea ever. Going through what I did, it encroached on every single aspect of my life. I spent my last two years at school studying for my A-levels, sitting at a lonesome desk, working from 8.30 a.m. in the morning to 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon when that bell, bell rang off. I lost my love for dance, for running. I lost friends, lost trust in my family, and I completely betrayed myself. And so for that, I'd say I cheated. I was a cheater because I truly cheated on the relationship I had with myself. Something I've always found quite difficult to describe is my alternative self. It's the alternative Holly that quite literally consumed me from the inside out. I think we can all imagine our own voice inside our own head. The one that's logical and rational. The one that tells you to go to bed in the evenings and stop watching Netflix because it's a bit too late. Or to maybe go outside and get some fresh air today because, you know, it's actually sunny in the UK for once. Of course, we don't always listen to this voice, but I just want you to imagine having a second, a companion almost. But I wouldn't really go as far as saying it provides the best form of company. I want you to firstly imagine a situation where you're hungry. I think we're all very familiar with that groaning of our stomachs and logic says you'd go and eat, right? Alternatively, you're running and your hip flexors don't feel quite tight. You'd stop, give it rest before it gets worse, surely. Or you're standing at yourself in a mirror, looking at yourself wearing a new outfit. We could hype ourselves up today, be kind and feel confident in our own skin because you know what, we're all beautiful in our own unique way. And whilst I truly believe that now, I certainly didn't back then. Welcoming this alternative holly into my life has been like an ongoing battle. You're hungry. I don't eat. You're injured. Let's just keep running. And you also look awful in that outfit, Holly. Why don't you fit those clothes? It's like the devil and the angel, the good, the bad, the rational versus the irrational. And for many, many years, this voice has been so loud, it's been deafening. It's guided everything from the foods I've eaten to the clothes I've worn and from the places I've explored into the conversations I've had, or probably not even had. When your mental health crumbles, everything crumbles with it. I let my confidence slip away, I lost my laugh, and my happy holy energy completely vanished. 
And for a long time, people as well told me just to flick a switch. Ignore that voice inside your head, Holly, and don't think twice about calories. You also look amazing in that outfit. Why can't you just believe it? Whilst I'd say that my darkest years were definitely my late teens, I continued to struggle after that. Within the high stress environment of Cambridge, coupled with my drive to perform really well academically, I quite simply swept all of my problems under the carpet. Everything was just swept under the rug and left to linger like dust, which nobody likes, right? My studies in particular have almost always acted as a distraction for me, and I've convinced myself that I'm okay, I'm fine, and there is definitely nothing wrong here at all. Again, let me emphasize, I don't know what led me down that path, and similarly, I don't know how I really found my way out of it. As annoying as it sounds, I think time and maturity are really quite important to this, but there are some other things that come to mind and I thought I'd share a couple with you. Firstly, I want to talk about Australia. And if you know me well, you saw that one coming. With solo travel, everyone talks about this idea of finding yourself. And to this day, I still don't know what that really means but I truly believe that it was during my three months solo traveling in Australia when I planted a seed. I started the process of trying to find myself again. And it's crazy that I did this in a place that's quite literally the furthest away from home I could possibly be. Whether it be from the time spent breathing underwater to quite literally keep myself alive, into the time spent on long overnight coach journeys, just listening to the thoughts inside my head I started to appreciate myself again, acknowledge what my body could do for me and just look after myself because with solo travel, yes, you meet so many other people, but it is solo at the end of the day. And so you have no other choice but to look after yourself. And if you don't, I'm afraid to say you will end up in hospital, which I did, by the way, and it's not my proudest achievement at all. Throughout the rest of my gap year, I spent my time just allowing my brain to wander in a healthy way. I imagined lots of different scenarios and found one that resonated with me the most, which led me to complete my master's at UCL. I did this entirely remotely and online at home, and it was during this time that I truly believe I found balance in my life, and this time with my family too. Whether it be through convincing myself that eating a bit more one day won't change the way I look overnight, or choosing to wear a dress that hugs my figure, I've taken baby steps every single day, and I've allowed myself to heal from the inside out. Recovery to me means having reached a point in my life where I am now. I am finally at peace with myself. Of course, I'll never be able to forget certain things or unknow the things I've been told or heard, but I finally silenced that alternative voice in my head. And yes, there is always more work we can do to better ourselves, but me, myself and I, we're pretty tight now and I'm very happy about that. While some of you listening may have been through something similar to me, I can imagine a lot of you haven't. And let me tell you, I don't wish anyone to go through the same struggles that I did. But I definitely think there's something in my story for everyone. So let me firstly ask you, when was the last time you looked at yourself in the mirror and said, wow, I look so good today? Or you took some time off to rest because you've worked hard all week and you deserve the break? Have you ever even taken yourself on a solo day? And no, it doesn't have to be on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, as I did just about a month ago this year, but I dare you to do that. The final memory I just want to share with you is something I told mum way back when I was still in school, but it was when I was given the first teeny tiny glimpse of hope that one day I'd fully recover. I sat in the car and I said, I want to share my story with others. And what I can say now is that I have an audience online who have followed me for quite a long time now. They've watched me grow and change, especially over, after, especially over this past year or so. 
from the once very homesick Cambridge fresher at this very university to the girl who fueled herself properly to run the 26.2 miles of the London Marathon. I am so incredibly grateful to have been able to share this online. Yes, I know all too well that loving yourself is not easy. And just like any relationship, your relationship with yourself needs solid foundations. Too many cracks and you'll crumble. And communication, I'm afraid to say, is key. I think it's important we ask ourselves, are we being honest with ourselves every single day? Are we listening to our bodies? And how are you really feeling today? The final thing I'm just going to leave you with is to say, please don't ever forget yourself in your very own story. Don't ever leave yourself behind because if you have no one else in your life, you will almost always have your very own self. And if you don't like that, I strongly recommend you start loving to do so as soon as we've finished here today. Thank you. <laughs>